Hi there everyone, it's really great to see you again. I hope I find you well. And today we've got a new product that's come out from Daypol. And this is actually quite an interesting one. It was passing underneath my radar, but now that I've got a chance to see it, I thought I'd share this with you. And also uh, don't forget that today's video has been sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. Don't forget to go and check them out at the link down below. And today we've got a locomotive review and the model comes courtesy of Daypol that have sent this over for review. But without further ado, come with me and I'll show you this exciting new locomotive from Daypol. <laughs> So here it is, it's the streamlined diesel rail car from Daypol and they do this in two different variations. They do it as the passenger rail car, I think these were nicknamed by the Great Western Railway who first introduced them as the flying banana uh, and you can actually see that from the picture with the shape. I can, I can hear the covered monkey behind the camera giggling at that. Um, but they also did it as a diesel parcels unit and I guess these were the forerunners of things like the class 128s and, and similar to that in the class 419s that we saw later on during the BR period but uh, the Great Western Railway were very much pioneers um, I think they even had their own air travel service at one point as well so they very much were quick to embrace new technologies now I'm just going to quickly show you the code on the end of the box there so we've got a code 4D011-101, streamlined rail car number 17, express parcels BR Crimson. So this is suitable for the, um, the era 4 period, the commonly used era system. And actually one of the things that really strikes me about Daypol products, and actually Helgen products too, is that even the packaging exudes quality. It just feels substantial. And in many respects, in this age of prices that are going up and up, it's just the little touches like this that really do make the end use a feel that they're getting value for money. Now we've got a load of paperwork in here, it's got the usual no quibble um, 24 month guarantee from Daypol, but also there's quite extensive guide which tells you how to uh, add on the optional accessories that come in a little packet, how to get the top off for DCC fitting and also some quite extensive um, guides to actually setting up your DCC decoder and that's always nice to see and it's something that uh, in the comments for the class 29 videos which was another day poll product that I did a review of recently it was quite interesting to see the comments coming through at um, how it was so welcome that finally manufacturers such as Daypol were really considering uh, the importance of DCC fitting models and making that easy for the end consumer. And uh, as I slide this out, I'm going to say um, a little bit about the different livery options that are available. Now you can get it in the GWR uh, livery, uh, the uh, chocolate and cream, the BR Crimson here for the parcel livery, but then I believe the rail cars as well are available for some of the slightly later BR liveries and uh, they never survived long enough to uh, get a tops number or anything but certainly these were the pioneers that made uh, the DMU revolution possible. Now in this little bag here we've got the front lamp and also a, a blanking thing that's just a push fit into the holes on the body. These are actually spares and it does actually tell you this in the paperwork that um, a couple of spares are provided just in case you lose them. So that is actually quite thoughtful from Daypol so, so that I don't lose them. I'm just going to put them over there. Uh, unclipping it all from the packaging again put that all to one side and here is the main feature and it's quite a simple model but of course it was quite a simple prototype and at first glance you might look at this and think 
sounds fairly basic, fairly utilitarian, but the GWR were kind of pioneers of Art Deco and all of that utilitarianism that went with it, but with that, that class that you didn't get in the 1960s brutalist period, where they kind of discovered concrete and forgot all sense of style. But the GWR did it properly, and you could imagine Poirot hitching a lift in one of these. It really does exude that uh, Art Deco-ness of the 1930s. By the time they reached BR period, um, well, this particular example built for parcels traffic. So you can see here, it doesn't include all the windows that actually probably lean down here and just get the uh, lid of the box back. That's actually showing the passenger example. Um, but actually for me, the express parcels version is the one that I would have gone for, for Weir Yard. It's actually a really good option. Don't let the fact that this is um, fairly slab-sided with no windows fool you into believing that there's less detail going on here. And when we get to the inside of this, I'm going to show you just how wrong that is. But first off, let's concentrate on the outside. You can see I've already fitted the lamp to the end that I've chosen as the leading end. Um, and uh, it's something that Daple does say in the instructions. Fit the lamp to the lead end and the blank to the uh, trailing end. The other thing as well which Daple have captured, which struck me as odd actually, when I took this out of the box I had to double take it, but it is actually very faithful to the prototype. It doesn't have buffers, it just has these kind of stalks, which I find most peculiar to look at, but that is perfectly faithful to the prototypes. The rest of the face has been captured really well, and just as we saw with the Class 29 model, this very complex curved design with curves that have uh, a radius that go in all manner of different directions has been captured really well. It could have been so easy to get this wrong, and even a minor error in one of those different radii would have made all the difference. But to my eye, Daypole really have captured the look of the uh, prototype perfectly. We can see in there we've got a fully detailed cab, and when I come to telling you about the lighting functions as well, you'll also see that um, it's got fully working cab lights. And this is something that Daypol really do seem to be at the forefront of in making full use of the DCC auxiliary functions. So I believe that you need, I think it's a um, six function decoder for this. The Daypol Imperium chips are perfectly compatible with it, but when I've also tried the Trainomatic ones from our sponsor, they also do seem to operate all of the lighting functions just fine. But um, it is something you need to make sure that your DCC decoder is MTC compliant. One of the other things that I've noticed is that there is a tremendous weight to this. And it's something that Daypol in particular, but certainly all manufacturers are really coming along in spades with, is that the weight that they're cramming into these models is immense. And it doesn't compromise, as you see in the inside, any of the space or the ease of access. But what it does mean is that you get very good electrical continuity and really good adhesion and it just has to be applauded. The bogies on these, they're actually dinky little things and it's only powered to one end. Uh, but as these never carried a tail load and prototypically you would only ever see them running in singles as far as I'm aware, it doesn't really matter. And actually I found there was no hint of slipping on this even when I was running it up and down 4% grades, which is pretty much at the limit of uh, what you would really want in a model layout. On the bottom there's a grill there and it's for the speaker if you want to fit these with sound. They do come with a sound fitted option from Daypol and I have heard these online. If you want to hear it go and have a look up Daypol TV YouTube channel. Um, it has got some sound footage of one of these with all of the different sound functions from the factory fitted variety. So if that's the route that you want to go that's well worth a listen to doesn't appear to have pickups from the second bogey and 
outwardly at least, I would have worried that perhaps that would have affected its electrical continuity. But actually when running this, I found it didn't exhibit any problems whatsoever. So it wasn't a handicap at all. If we turn back again to the roof, you can see all of the pipe and vent detail is perfectly realized, even down to these almost faint conduits, which could have been so easy for Daypol to leave off, but they haven't. They've got it all as per the prototype. Again, there's a lot of different curves with different radii on this model, and the roof line captures that well. It arcs across in a very gentle curve, but then the tumble home at the side goes into a much steeper curve. There's no definite transition harsh between the two. It just kind of flows as the prototype did. On the sides of this model, we have separately applied metal handrails on there, and then these recessed doors with flush glazing. And actually, what's quite nice about these is they've managed to uh, avoid the pitfall of getting that almost Coke bottle effect around the edges. The glazing on these really does look nice and sharp, and that is quite pleasing to see. On the lower edge of the skirt, we've got all the louvre details and the panelling. It does look a little bit flat to me, but when I've looked at photographs of the original, actually they were pretty streamlined as well. Streamlining was, well, I wouldn't go as far as calling it a fad in the 1930s, but certainly it was the big thing. It did provide some degree of fuel economy savings, but it also looked the part, and I suspect that a lot of this streamlining was more about PR than actually being effective for cutting fuel costs and increasing speeds. It also fits perfectly with the Art Deco look of the time, and no more so than the Great Western Railway were masters at capturing the look and feel of that period. On the bogies as well, it's nice to see that Daypol have captured the, uh, the difference between the different bogie sides. The prototypes have this kind of strange connecting drive between the axle boxes, and it's only on one side of each bogie. So you can see there this bogie has it, and when we move to the back we have that very slab-sided look of the one that doesn't. But it does have all that rivet detail. And that's actually really fine rivet detail. I'm not a rivet counter, but it does look the part for having it there. If I turn to the other side, you can see that they've done the same again with the uh, model of the transmission drive on the bogey and the flat side at the other end. Now at this point, there's not a lot else to show you on the outside. It's a really smooth runner, and uh, quite frankly, it's, um, it's performed faultlessly. I had it running for nearly three hours non-stop, and there was no sign of any deterioration. There was no grumbling from the drive. It just worked, and it worked well, even down to an absolute crawl over some quite complicated point work. There was no hint of hesitation from it at all. I'd just like to show as well the tampo printing. Well, there's not a lot of it, but that's true and faithful to the prototype. We have its running number, W17W, and then the express parcels up here. Very utilitarian, but captured perfectly. To get inside this model, it couldn't be simpler. You just get your fingernails, feel for the edge of the body sides, either side in the middle, and as the instructions tell you to, hold it over a flat surface and gently pull apart you'll feel the inside just drop and this whole body just slides off. Unlike the Class 29, there's no electrical stuff inside here, so you don't have to worry about tugging on cables and possibly pulling them loose. Uh, there's just no worry of that. If I put that to, in, to one side, this for me really was the standout. You can see there that the interior is fully modelled, even where there's no windows to even see. So you can see there, matching it up, it's got the, the actual parcels racks modelled all the way through. And that is actually quite an attention to detail. On this side, they're modelled in the upright position. But if I turn it round, they're modelled in the lowered position. And actually, this model just looks to me like a, a very pleasant couple of hours modelling could be had, loading it up with parcels on some of these shelves. 
I don't really care that you can't see them once the body's on. The fact that I'd know that they were there would be a pleasure enough for me. We can see there as well, there's easy access to the cabs to put uh, driver figures in and crew. So um, we've just got fairly basic chairs modelled in there. Looking to the underside of the body, there's no... Um, no other detail inside there, but actually it doesn't look too bad through the windscreens. On the top of the inside, we've got these four dip switches, and these are to control the different lighting functions, primarily if you're going to be running this on DC, and it does have some incredible lighting functions that go above and beyond the call of duty. It has directional controlled lights that show light to the front, red to the back, express lights too, but then it also has cab lights independent at both ends. And finally, it's got a coach lighting bar, which you can see just in there, the little LEDs poking through this roof area, and those illuminate the entire interior. They're all set up to work off different functions off the DCC controller. So for me, on my Gauge Master, F0 controlled the directional lights, and then we had F1, F2, F3, and F4 all just worked to control those extra lighting functions. One detraction on the inside I did see, and really I can't see quite how Daypol could have avoided this, and I suppose if you have the rail car with the passenger seats, this would be much better disguised, but we have a slight raised portion there for the motor. Unfortunately, there's nothing that can be done about that, and it just happens to line up with where one of the side windows in the door is, so you can actually see that from outside. However, another golden opportunity for the modeler. How about a pile of parcels being sorted, ready to go out, or even on a trolley, cut away at the bottom, stuck over the top of that, and Bob's your uncle. It's just another way that you can personalise your model and improve it a little bit by disguising that motor. To DCC fit this, well, it's pretty easy. All you're going to need is a very fine jeweler screwdriver crosshead. There's a screw at either end, just holding this inner part uh, down. Unscrew there, turn it round, unscrew there. Now you'll find that there's some sticky pads as well. So when you come to move this, you might feel like it doesn't want to move. Persevere, it's just sticky pads. But do be careful, because as you see here, as we take this to one side, there are some wires attached for that lighting and to connect to the dip switches. There really isn't a lot of slack on here, so just be absolutely careful not to pull on that. Once we get to the inside, you can see it's got the Super Creep motor, flywheel, and a carbon shaft drive to that single bogey. At the other, other side of the motor, there is actually space for what looks like another flywheel, but it doesn't come with it. And certainly, if you want to improve the smooth running of this, that's possibly an addition that a modeler could do. But actually, I found in running, it didn't really need it. The DCC decoder is housed here. And all you need to do is use a flathead screwdriver to gently pry it up from either side and just lift it out. It's actually the easiest thing in the world to chip these and there's no reason why you should find yourself needing to pay somebody else to do it. Uh, for me, it just went in, worked, first time, every time. I've used a Trainomatic 21 pin chip and I found that I don't need to change any of the CV settings in here at all. You can also see room there for a speaker to fit down into the, the base and the holes drilled for the speaker sound to go on through. You could also use that space if you so desired for a stay alive capacitor or a programmable smart power pack. But actually, again, I didn't find that this locomotive particularly needed it. Putting it back together is easy. Just do those screws up, clip it back on and you're done, ready to go. So... To the scores, let's see what this Daypol Express Parcels set XGWR railcar scores. For finish, well, it's fairly utilitarian, but again, that's true to the prototype. The GWR versions certainly were far more ornate, but um, certainly what livery there is here is well executed by Daypol.
The tampo printing as well is pretty sharp, it's all there, and the grey on the roof is fully demarked perfectly. But it is a pretty utilitarian livery, it does have its charm, and I'm going to score this a 9.4 out of 10. In terms of functionality, well, out of the box it just worked. It ran and it ran superbly. It never put a wheel wrong. It didn't need anything like a Stay Alive or a Smart Power Pack. It just kept on chugging, hour after hour, with no sign of gripe from the gear train, and I didn't need to add any kind of lubrication. Those lighting functions as well, I'm really pleased to see how well Daypol are embracing the DCC aspects. And with all those different lighting functions, it really does add another dimension to this product. So for functionality, I'm gonna give this a 9.9 .9 out of 10. Ease of use. Principally for DCC fitting, it really is a doddle. Daypol have really got on top of this. No more do we have to fiddle around trying to get detail on and off and risking damaging a model just to get a DCC decoder inside it. With this, it really is quite easy. Not as easy as the Class 29, but certainly those two extra screws are no real barrier to getting inside and gaining access to all aspects of this model. So for ease of use, I'm gonna give this a 9.8 out of 10. For aesthetics, well, in my view, Daypol have captured the uh, look of this rather strange prototype really, really well. There isn't really anything to fault. They've got everything as it should be. Even those bogies have that peculiar utilitarian charm to them. So for me, aesthetics, I'm going to give it a 9.5 out of 10. Now, value for money. A lot of people do complain about, well, it's just effectively a single coach with a motor in, but it's a lot more than that. This is a quirky prototype that would not look out of place on a GWR layout right through to a BR layout. And indeed, at least one of these does survive into preservation. Other livery options are available, and I particularly like the look of the Great Western Railway ones as well. And certainly that's something which I'm going to look to pick up in the future, because I believe it really is a model with a charm all to itself. So value for money, I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10. All added together, that goes to a pretty respectable score of 47.6 out of 50 for this quirky prototype. And I'm really pleased that Daypol have sent this over for review. It is a lovely model. It might be a little bit more difficult to use operationally because it can't haul any other stock, but certainly as something different to send around the layout. It's a really good idea. And for those modelers who are space starved, who have a very, very small shunting type layout, this is a really good option for a short passenger train to make that model ever more viable with more operational interest. Well, I hope you've really enjoyed that video. It's been great having the opportunity to show you over this really quite amazing product that's come through from Daypol. And a big, big thanks to them for sending over today's review sample. Don't forget to like this video and also share it too and uh, subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so and you'll be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. And just remember that uh, if you like the look of today's model, you can find yourself your own example by following the affiliate links down below. And uh, don't worry about this, it does not cost you anything extra. We've pointed them at a couple of retailers who we believe have got them at a really great price. And uh, it won't cost you a single penny more. Instead, it actually just helps the channel. So really, really glad of your support. But until next time, it's been great having your company. And I hope to see you again. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon, but a special thanks go out to Anthony Kidson, Michael Churchwood, Alec Ralph, Anthony Hunt, William Wade, Wayne Johns, Offshore Allen, oorail.co.uk, Tepic, Michael Lockie, and Helen Sink. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.